Hi, Ron. Thank you very much for coming to give an update for Open Medicine yeah. Foundation today. Um, to it. Obviously, it's been a very uh, interesting year this past year, and a lot of things that we've been working on um, have been kind of progressing in their own way. I think, obviously, COVID-19 has had some interruptions, but also created some opportunities. Um, I know from some of the work that you're doing, it's quite interesting in its relationship to infection. Um, I'm speaking specifically of uh, looking for the genetics uh, within pathogens or for genetics from pathogens within uh, patients. So I thought maybe we would start with that and maybe you could just give a little description of what that project's about. Well, you know, the patients look like they have an infection, the, the way they behave, you know, the, and, and the fatigue happens with an infection. So uh, it's always been a question, well, maybe they do have an infection, and, uh, but you'd like to have evidence for that. And uh, so one way to get that evidence is that these organisms will be killed uh, by the immune system at some level, usually. And when they get killed, they release their DNA or RNA, depending on what the organism is. And then you can find that in the bloodstream. Um, now, of course, with the patients, we can only take out so much blood. Um, and so you have to worry about in 10 mils of blood, how many DNA molecules or RNA molecules are in that. Uh, and, and so you have a certain sensitivity. Uh, we would like to develop some technology where you take blood out, pull out the DNA and put the blood back. That way you could go through and recover a large amount of of material and make the sense of the, the assay more sensitive. So when we come up with a negative result, it doesn't mean there's not anything there, um, but it means it's, we can't detect it. So um, the, the first pass was the herpes viruses would be a, a major candidate. So we have made, uh, we've developed a technology that allows us to simultaneously amplify up different regions of, of, of the organism. And we do about 10 different regions of each organism. And we do them all simultaneously in, the, in a single tube. Uh, that's called a multiplex reaction. And I have a, uh, Badang Shen is a real expert. He's a trained as a chemist. He's really good at this kind of stuff. And worked out a whole new tech, simple technology that's very inexpensive uh, to do this. And, uh, so we, 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 we can look at, a, uh, he's set up to look at 20 different DNA viruses that are the sort of primary candidates that we think might be present and causing a problem. Uh, but recently he's also done 17 RNA viruses. Uh, Entrovirus is one that's been implement, implement, uh, implicated in uh, MECFS in the past. Uh, so that's just, uh, that work has just started. Uh, we've done uh, about 100 patients and 100 healthy controls uh, with just the DNA viruses at the first pass, uh, and we'll start doing the RNA viruses real soon. Uh, but so far, what that is indicating to us is that we don't see any obvious major amplification of, of uh, these herpes viruses and other DNA viruses compared to healthy controls. Uh, we really need to do more patients. Also, uh, patients sometimes say that they, uh, they think they have a reactivated virus. And so we'd like to get a connection with the local patients so that we can actually get a sample uh, from them when they think they have a viral infection and, and see if, uh, if we can confirm that. Again, uh, that confirmation is to the sensitivity that we have. But we can certainly see it in uh, healthy people. These reactivations occur. Uh, in most cases, they have vir virtually no symptoms. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. I think I know that uh, this technology um, is also going to be utilized uh, within this COVID-2 ME project that a number, of, or collaborative, a number of the collaborative research centers are working on. Um, I know that you're going to be interested in determining if there are any viruses uh, as opposed, I mean, obviously you'll have the COVID virus, but as uh, in addition to that virus, other pathogens that may be reactivated during that infection phase when they're collecting those samples uh, from within the hospital. So um, I think that will be obviously quite interesting. Do you have any thoughts um, to add? 
we've done a small number of those patients. I think like six, <laughs> it's, it, and it's, it's a matter of getting access to the to the samples. Um, and because what could be, we th it looks like uh, the, the COVID patients, uh, some fraction of them are not recovering, and they're called long COVID. And it looks like from their symptoms and also some some of the physicians, uh, they're diagnosed uh, clearly diagnosed with MACFS. So uh, our guess would be maybe 10% of the COVID patients will be coming down with MACFS. So what is possible is that the COVID doesn't create it directly, is that it activates something like EBV, which we know can cause it, and that activated EBV is what's causing it. Uh, that's important to know because if that's the case, then you could, uh, you could be treating these patients with anti-herpes virus uh, and you know, drugs to maybe prevent that from happening. Uh, but we need to do it quickly because there's millions of people who've already had the COVID. And uh, anyway, um, and it's been really tough to get the government to come up with grant money to do that. Um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that uh, this could also be a parasite. Uh, they're hard to analyze and they're hard to spot. So, um, and doctors will say, well, no, you don't have a parasite. Well, they don't look. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So, and why don't you look? Well, because you wouldn't have one. <laughs> anyway, um, so we've made, made probes for lots of the common uh, parasites that are pretty, particularly, particularly bad that also could last in, you know, a long time. And one reason for doing that was that the symptoms of sleeping sickness uh, uh, are very similar to uh, MECFS. And so uh, that's caused by a trypanosome. So we put in probes for all the different tryp trypanosomes. Uh, that's just guessing, right? That that might yep. be possible. Uh, and then we've also done um, probes for the ribosomal region. We'll sequence, we'll sequence up the ribosomal region and for all the bacteria and all the, all the funguses. Uh, again, uh, that just giving us an idea of what might be there, and uh, that's first pass. So, and do you? So that's, uh, that's that's ongoing, and we'll as soon as we get, we were ready to do this when the pandemic happened, and then what with the pandemic, you can't have patients come in. All the clinics were shut down. The MECFS clinic at Stanford was shut down, and they only only allowed COVID patients to be there. So. Um, unless it was an emergency. So um, we're, we're trying now to reactivate and bring patients back in um, and also get connected with some of the other clinics that have patients to yeah. get samples. Yeah. I mean, obviously there has been some obstacles from this pandemic. We all know that. Um, in terms of some of the opportunities, I guess, you know, we are doing this collaborative study. We are getting samples from people who have COVID uh, at, during the significant phase of their infection, which is actually quite, it's quite difficult to get, you know, hold of samples from people at the initial stages of a, of a significant infection. So that, I guess, those samples are presenting an opportunity for you to identify, I guess, whether there are going to be these treatments. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. correct. And so in terms of this type of technology, you know, how do you think it relates to, I guess, the general pathogenesis? Are you thinking of this being... Uh, interesting in terms of a trigger or something that could be continually maintaining um, MECFS as a disease? Well, it's possible why the, the disease lasts so long as you get reactivation of things like ABV or HHV6, and that kind of starts the whole disease all over again. And so that could keep people in it. And that's one of the, you know, why do people not get well? You, you know, you usually get a, a disease uh, or an infection and you get over it and you're not getting over it. And so uh, a reactivation of a, of a virus could actually keep you sick. That's why it's important to look at. And uh, we'll continue to do that. It's very simple. It's, not, it's now very cheap uh, and it's very easy to do. So because the technology was set up to make it easy and cheap. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the hallmark of your group uh, getting you know, fantastic technology cheap. I think that's, uh, that's a testament to kind of the research that you've been doing there for a long period of time. Um, just interesting, I guess, talking about the pathogenesis of MECFS. Obviously, that's a good segue to talk about maybe the metabolic trap update um, as a potential other hypothesis for the disease. Um, 
where are we at with this metabolic trap? Um, and yeah. Well, so the metabolic that? trap is, uh, and, there, and there, there may be other traps as well. And so uh, the thoughts are that something has happened to the patients where they can't get well, otherwise they would. So we're looking for something that can get, can get into a st state where you can't get out of it. And uh, it looks very much like a, some kind of metabolic disease and, and because you see such big alterations in metabolism. So uh, that's why we've been looking at metabolism a lot. And so one of the possibilities is uh, what happens right after you, when you have an infection, and that's what we have to look at because that's what starts the disease, is that tryptophan is released from the albumin and that tryptophan then floods and is taken up by the immune, a class of immune cells. And then those immune cells convert the tryptophan to canurinine and that process of making canurinine inside of these immune cells allows those cells to regulate the immune system. And they, that, that, pass, that pathway can allow them to suppress things like autoimmunity. <clears throat> and then that's what, that's what cancer uh, does. It activates this enzyme and makes canurinine and that makes the cancer cells uh, resistant to attack by the immune system. So the canurinine production is really seems to be key for the immune system. Now, a mistake has been made by a lot of the investigators in their thinking, and that they say, well, that can't possibly be the case because the liver makes canurinine. Yeah, that's true. But that canurinine cannot get into the immune cells in sufficient amounts. Now, that's something that Rob Fair, who came up with this idea, uh, he can model all this, and he can model this in terms of modeling it in terms of the transport of canurinine into cells it has to compete with the amino acids and it doesn't compete well. So you really cannot get canurinine from the plasma into these cells. It has to be made in the cells. You have to import tryptophan, which does get in effectively, and then it can get converted to canurinine. So, um, um, so it sounds uh, like obviously, you know, the, uh, the technology or to test this, this, this hypothesis is, is going to involve uh, utilizing cells and looking at metabolism within the cells themselves. Right. So uh, what's unusual is the fact that this enzyme that's made from the idea one gene, uh, which does the conversion to, to tryptophan to canurinine is unusual. And this is a paper published in 1967 that Rob Fair knows about. Uh, and that shows that uh, this enzyme is substrate inhibitable. Very unusual. So in other words, the substrate that it normally uses, if that substrate gets too high in concentration, it inhibits the enzyme. So if you were to inhibit the enzyme, that means you can't make canurinine. And if you can't make canurinine, you can't regulate. And the only way to, to go back to being able to regulate is you've got to get rid of the tryptophan. Well, the only way to get rid of the tryptophan, as far as we can model it, is for the enzyme to be active, but it's not, it's substrate inhibited. So uh, it could spontaneously, in some sense, sometimes reactivate enough to get the tryptophan down, and then you would presumably get cured. But the probability of that is extremely low. And, you, and in fact, you do see some patients that do get over us, but not many. Yeah. So that, that's, that's, that's why we call it a metabolic trap uh, in the sense that it can't get out of it uh, because it needs the enzyme to get out of it. So the question is, that's just in that you can see this in the test tube with purified enzymes. The question is, does it actually happen in the cell? So we've done two different things. One is that we've engineered yeast, which is very quickly to be engineered and work with. And we have a lot of expertise in yeast. So we put the human IDO1 gene into yeast and we put it under control so we can control the level of it. Uh, and then to see whether or not it works, uh, we, the canurinine that it will make from tryptophan uh, can be used to make NAD, which is a very essential component for survival and growth of the cell. There's, there's a number of ways to make uh, NAD. So we've deleted those from the genome of this yeast. 
So the only way you can make NAD is to make canurinine. And then make canurinine, it has to turn the gene on and convert tryptophan to canurinine. So if we put that yeast into high tryptophan concentration just in growth, it won't grow. It stops growing. Wow. And, uh, and if you put in canurinine, it doesn't get taken up super well, but the yeast will then start growing. So it shows that the block is at the canurinine level. That's excellent. So you've proven, like, you know, I guess you've shown that this trap does exist. So from the theoretical to the, to the, to the real, but now how do you, how do you plan to kind of transfer that to determine whether this trap is existing within MECFS patients? One other interesting little con con connection to that is that if we then remove the tryptophan and let the yeast cells set there for a while, eventually they start growing. Oh. And then we look into yeast and we realize that there's a couple of other genes that will convert tryptophan to other amino acids. In other words, they consume the tryptophan, which is what you have to do to un undo the block. So we've simply deleted those genes. Now you do it, and now the yeast don't grow. Okay, okay. Right? So that's also kind of confirming uh, the idea that if you get rid of the tryptophan, you can, you can start growing. Now, the value of that system is two things. One, it shows that you can do this in in vivo, in the, in the cell. You can initiate the trap, and it does exactly what we expected, uh, um, but like it is in the test tube. But with yeast, what we want to do, and that's why I talked about the fact that you've got to get rid of the uh, you got to get rid of the tryptophan in, uh, to, in order to grow. Um, that's also what you want to do if this trap is what's causing the disease. Uh, we have to act reactivate the IDO1 uh, gene product, the protein, in order for it to convert the tryptophan to canurinine and get rid of the, trypt the tryptophan. So that might be done by a small, by some existing drug. It would bind to the enzyme and prevent it from being uh, inhibited. In other words, it would inhibit the inhibitor. <laughs> now that's just a screen. Now uh, you can do those screens in test tubes and all that, but, but yeast makes it really a really simple thing. You simply take a large plate, put in lots of tryptophan, get the cells there and they're now blocked, but they're sitting on the plate, they're not dead, they just don't grow. And you simply spot a little bit of compound on those plates. And you can actually, uh, you could even set up an automation system to spot those come up. We have all of the update approved drugs in our freezer because we actually work with all of them to, to, and, and looking at the effects it has on yeast. So what we want to do is look at different concentrations. So we're not interested in the concentration that the drug is used in humans. Uh, in fact, you, can't, you have to use a much higher concentration on yeast just to get it in because yeast doesn't, <laughs> is, is a barrier to most compounds. And so uh, you simply put a solid amount of, of the drug at a spot, it then diffuses, and as it diffuses, it lowers its concentration. And you, what you look for is a ring of growth. So it is at a concentration now that will in, uh, uh, inhibit the uh, the, the in innovation, so to speak. And, and you can see that it, uh, even though at, uh, right near the spot, it may be too high a concentration and that actually, that drug itself inhibits the growth. So you don't have to do a whole bunch of experiments at different concentrations to see which one works. You just look at the plate and see if you see a ring. Your eye is really good at seeing that kind of thing. So you could do a large number on each plate. Well, so you, could through, you could go through the entire collection of FDA approved drugs fairly quickly and cheaply. That's also a very cheap thing to do. We're just going to set that up. We have also have robots that we can do these things and do growth curves and that sort of thing. Probably I would prefer to uh, do a few of those and, as well as the plates because we don't want to miss something. But also um, we can do a, a much finer analysis of what concentration to use. Then also we've done this with... Uh, uh, Rob is in, uh, Rob Fair is in charge of doing that. Uh, he's working with some of the uh, our really good technicians. We have some fantastic technicians 
uh, uh, the best I've ever seen. And uh, they're technicians, they're, they're not PhDs, but they're operating at the PhD level. And um, they have set up uh, uh, taking immune cells and converting them to, to, uh, to monocytes. And then um, those cells have the pathway on IDO, uh, have the IDO1 gene active in those. Now we have to stimulate them to produce the enzyme and LPS is what's often used because LPS activates this whole thing. And that's, that's what mimics an infection. And then uh, uh, if you then uh, put in lots of tryptophan and, and uh, the, these experiments are done by first inhibiting the enzyme. So it allows the tryptophan to accumulate. And then you wash out the drug, but uh, keeping them in high tryptophan. Um, uh, uh, they are blocked. And so it looks like the metabolic trap works in human cells as well. Now those will be a good source for other types of experiments looking at it. Uh, and also uh, can we um, wash out the, the, the media from the tryptophan and still keep them trapped. Uh, they shouldn't export the tryptophan very effectively, but we don't know for sure. And uh, so that's, those are the experiments that are now going on. Now, those experiments have happened recently. Those are just uh, cells coming from the blood bank because we were un, uh, not allowed to have patients enter the lab to take a blood sample. And so uh, we're just now getting back to being able to have patients in the lab. And now we desperately need to have good patients to come into the lab now. Uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of experiments with archived frozen cells that we've had uh, that when we do a blood sample, uh, we prepare cells, we do a few experiments with them and anything left over gets frozen. So we've had a, a, a large archive of, of, of MECFS cells uh, and that's been running the uh, immunology with Mark Davis for, for a long time now. Uh, but we, we're, we're running out of frozen cells. We've got to get new fresh samples in. So I'm encouraged by this. We don't know if the metabolic trap is what's causing the problem, but it is certainly feasible and it fits the, it fits the sort of the biology. It, this would happen after an infection. And uh, that's what you have to look at. What's causing uh, MACFS? Is it often an infection? And uh, it's involving immune cells. Uh, it's involving immune cell regulation. It's conurning is the ma a major regulator. Uh, conurning in the brain uh, suppresses inflammation. So there's just a, a lot of correlations with this behavior of this pathway and what you see in the patients. So it's sufficiently uh, connected that we really need to, uh, to explore it. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like a definitely very, very interesting area. A lot of people are very interested in it. Um, so thank you very much for giving that really lengthy update on that.